Hey everyone! So I'm gonna read some more Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation by Sylvia Federici. Um, should I wear glasses? There is a bit of a dog barking in the background. Hopefully you can't hear it too much, but if you can, I'm sorry. And okay. Let's get into it. <laughs> okay. Where we left off was the price revolution and the pauperization of the European working class. In the second chapter called Accumulation of Labor and Degradation of Women. Okay. This inflationary phenomenon, which due to its devastating social consequences has been named the price revolution, was attributed by contemporaries and later economists, e.g. Adam Smith, to the arrival of gold and silver from America, pouring into Europe through Spain in a mammoth stream. But it has been noted that prices had been rising before these metals started circulating through the European markets. Moreover, in themselves, gold and silver are not capital and could have been put to other uses, e.g. to make jewelry or golden cupolas or to embroider clothes. If they functioned as price-regulating devices capable of turning even wheat into a precious commodity. This was because they were planted into a developing capitalist world in which a growing percentage of the population, one third in England, had no access to land and had to buy the food that they had once produced. And because the ruling class had learned to use the magical power of money to cut labor costs. In other words, prices rose because of the development of a national and international market system, encouraging the export-import of agricultural products, and because merchants hoarded goods to sell them later at a higher price. In September 1565, in Antwerp, while the poor were literally starving in the streets, a warehouse collapsed under the weight of the grain packed in it. It was under these circumstances that the arrival of the American treasure triggered a massive redistribution of wealth and a new proletarianization process. Rising prices ruined the small farmers who had to give up their land to buy grain or bread when the harvest could not feed their families and created a class of capitalist entrepreneurs who accumulated fortunes by investing in agriculture and money lending at a time when having money was for many people a matter of life or death. The price revolution also triggered a historic collapse in the real wage comparable to that which has occurred in our time throughout Africa, Asia, and Latin America in the countries structurally adjusted by the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. By 1600, real wages in Spain had lost 30% of their purchasing power with respect to what they had been in 1511. And the, coll the collapse was just as sharp in other countries. While the price of food went up eight times, wages increased only by three times. This was not the work of the invisible hand of the market, but the product of a state policy that prevented laborers from organizing. While giving merchants the maximum freedom with regard to the pricing and movement of goods. Predictably, within a few decades, the real wage lost two-thirds of its purchasing power, as shown by the changes that intervened in the daily wages of an English carpenter, expressed in kilograms of grain 
between the 14th and 18th century. Damn. So he just like lost money. It just like goes down. As you can see, he just like makes less money. Which is crazy because you feel like, oh, like everyone's rich now and people used to be poor or something, but like that's really not how it is. It took centuries for wages in Europe to return to the level they had reached in the late Middle Ages. Things deteriorated to the point that in England by 1550, male artisans had to work 40 weeks to earn the same income that at the beginning of the century they had been able to obtain in 15 weeks. In France, you should talk about France. Wages dropped by 60% between 1470 and 1570. The wage collapse was especially disastrous for women. In the 14th century, they had received half the pay of a man for the same task. But by the mid-16th century, they were receiving only one-third of the reduced male wage and could no longer support themselves by wage work, neither in agriculture nor in manufacturing, a fact undoubtedly responsible for the massive spread of prostitution in this period. What followed was the absolute impoverishment of the European working class, a phenomenon so widespread in general that by 1550 and long after, workers in Europe were referred to as simply the poor. Evidence for this dramatic impoverishment is the change that occurred in the workers' diets. Meat disappeared from their tables, except for a few scraps of lard, and so did beer and wine, salt, and olive oil. From the 16th to the 18th centuries, the workers' diets consisted essentially of bread, the main expense in their budget. This was a historic setback. Whatever we may think of dietary norms, compared to the abundance of meat that had typified the late Middle Ages. Peter Kreta writes that at, the t at that time, the annual meat consumption had reached the figure of 100 kilos per person an incredible quantity even by today's standards. Up to the 19th century, this figure declined to less than 20 kilos. Brodel too speaks of the end of carnivorous Europe, summoning as a witness the Swabian Heinrich Mueller, who in 1550 commented that, in the past, they ate differently at the peasant's house. Then there was meat, and food in profusion every day. Tables at village fairs and feasts sank under their load. Today, everything has truly changed. For some years, in fact, what a calamitous time, what high prices. And the food of the most comfortably off peasants is almost worse than that of day laborers and valets previously. Not only did meat disappear, but food shortages became common, aggravated in times of harvest failure, when the scanty grain reserves sent the price of grain sky high, condemning city dwellers to starvation. This is what occurred in the famine years of the 1540s and 1550s, and again in the decade of the 1580s and 1590s, which were some of the worst in the history of the European proletariat, coinciding with widespread unrest and a record number of witch trials. But malnutrition was rampant also in normal times, so that food acquired a high symbolic value as a marker of rank. The desire for it among the poor reached epic proportions, inspiring dreams of Pantagruelian orgies like those described by Rabelais in his Gargantua and Pantagruel and causing nightmarish obsessions such as conviction spread among northeastern Italian farmers that witches roamed the countryside at night to feed upon their cattle. Okay.
Here's some charts about the price revolution and the fall of the real wage from 1480 to 1640. The price revolution triggered a historic collapse in the real wage. Within a few decades, a real wage lost two-thirds of its purchasing power. The real wage did not return to the level it had reached in the 15th century until the 19th century. Okay, this one, there's collapsing, and then this one, over the years, in those years. The social consequences of the price revolution are revealed by these charts, which indicate respectively the rise in the price of grain in England between 1490 and 1650. Okay. The concomitant rise in prices and property crimes in Essex, England between 1566 and 1602. And the population decline measured in millions in Germany, Austria, Italy, and Spain between 1500 and 1750. Wait, why is it decline? It looks like it's like going up. I don't know what's happening. Maybe like this one, this part where it goes down. Anyway, indeed, the Europe that was preparing to become a Promethean world mover, presumably taking humankind to new technological and cultural heights, was a place where people had never had enough to eat. Food became an object of such intense desire that it was believed that the poor sold their souls to the devil to get their hands on it. Europe was also a place where, in times of bad harvests, country folk fed upon acorns, wild roots, or the barks of trees, and multitudes roved the countryside, weeping and wailing, so hungry that they would devour the beans in the fields. Or they invaded the cities to benefit from grain distributions, or to attack the houses and granaries of the rich, who in turn rushed to get arms and shut the city gates to keep the starving out. That the transition to capitalism inaugurated a long period of starvation for workers in Europe, which plausibly ended because of the economic expansion produced by colonization, is also demonstrated by the fact that while in the 14th and 15th centuries the proletarian struggle had centered around the demand for liberty and less work, by the 16th and 17th it was mostly spurred by hunger. taking the form of assaults on bakeries and granaries, and of riots against the export of local crops. The authorities described those who participated in these attacks as good for nothing, or poor and humble people, but most were craftsmen living by this time from hand to mouth. It was the women who usually initiated and led the food revolts. Six of the 31 food riots in the 17th century France studied by Yves-Marie Berset, were made up exclusively of women. In the other, the female presence was so conspicuous that Berset calls them women's riots. Commenting on this phenomenon, with reference to 18th century England, Sheila Rao Botham concluded that women were prominent in this type of protest because of their role as the family's caretakers. But women all, were also those most ruined by high prices for having ac less, less access to money and employment than men. They were more dependent on cheap food for survival. This is why, despite their subordinate status, they took quickly to the streets when food prices went up. Or when rumors spread that the grain supplies were being removed from town. This is what happened at the time of the Cordobas uprising of 1652, which started early in the morning 
when a poor woman went weeping through the streets of the poor quarter, holding the body of her son who had died of hunger. The same occurred in Montpellier in 1645, when women took to the streets to protect their children from starvation. And in France, women besieged the bakeries when they became convinced that grain was to be embezzled, or found out that the rich had bought the best had bought the best bread and the remainder the remaining was lighter or more expensive. Crowds of poor women would then gather at the bakers' stalls, demanding bread and charging the bakers with hiding their supplies. Riots broke out also in the squares where grain markets were held or along the routes taken by the carts with the corn to be exported, and at the riverbanks where boatmen could be seen loading the stack. Sacks. On these occasions, the rioters ambushed the carts with pitchforks and sticks, the men carrying away the sacks, the women gathering as much grain as they could in their skirts. The struggle for food was fought also by other means, such as poaching, stealing from one's neighbor's fields or homes, and assaults on the houses of the rich. In Troyes in 1523, rumor had it that the poor had put the houses of the rich on fire preparing to invade them. At Malin, in the Low Countries, the houses of speculators were marked by angry peasants with blood. Not surprisingly, food crimes loom large in the disciplinary procedures of the 16th and 17th centuries. <coughs> Excuse me. Exemplary is the recurrence of the theme of the diabolical banquet in the witch trials. <coughs> suggesting that feasting on roasted mutton, white bread, and a wine was now considered a diabolical act in the case of the common people. But the main weapons available to the poor in their struggle for survival were their own famished bodies, as in times of famine, hordes of vagabonds and beggars surrounded the better off, half dead of hunger and disease, grabbing their arms, exposing their wounds to them, and forcing them to live in a state of constant fear at the prospect of both contamination and revolt. You cannot walk down a street or stop in a square, a Venetian man wrote in the mid-16th century, without multitudes surrounding you to beg for charity. You see hunger written on their faces, their eyes like gemless rings, the wretchedness of their bodies with skins shaped only by bones. A century later in Florence, the scene was about the same. It was impossible to hear mass, one G. Balducci complained in April 1650. So much was one importuned during the service by wretched people naked and covered with sores. There's an engraving by Lucas van Leyden from 1520 of a family of vagabonds. <laughs> Okay. The state intervention <coughs> in the reproduction of labor, poor relief, and the criminalization of the working class. The struggle for food was not the only front in the battle against the spread of capitalist relations. Everywhere, masses of people resisted the destruction of their former ways of existence, fighting against land privatization, the abolition of customary rights, the imposition of new taxes, wage dependence, and the continuous presence of armies <clears throat> in their neighborhoods which was so hated that people rushed to close the gates of their towns to prevent soldiers from settling among them. In France, 1,000 emotions, was what they called upri um, uprisings, occurred between the 1530s and 1670s, many involving entire provinces and requiring the intervention of troops. England, Italy, and Spain present a similar picture, indicating that the pre-capitalist world of the village, which Marx dismissed under the rubric of rural isolation, 
could produce as high a level of struggle as any the industrial proletariat has waged. In the Middle Ages, migration, vagabondage, and the rise of crimes against property were part of the resistance to impoverishment and dispossession. These phenomena took, now took on massive proportions. Everywhere, if we give credit to the complaints of the contemporary authorities, vagabonds were swarming, changing cities, crossing borders, sleeping in the haystacks, or crowding at the gates of towns, a vast humanity involved in a diaspora of its own that for decades escaped the authorities' control. 6,000 vagabonds were reported in Venice alone in 1545. In Spain, vagrants cluttered the road, stopping at every town. Starting with England, always a pioneer in these matters, the state passed new, far harsher, anti-vagabond laws prescribing enslavement and capital punishment in cases of recidivism. 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 But repression was not effective, and the roads of 16th and 17th century Europe remained places of great commotion and encounters. Through them passed heretics escaping persecution, discharged soldiers, journeymen and other humble folk in search of employment, and then foreign artisans, evicted peasants, prostitutes, hucksters, petty thieves, professional beggars. Above all, through the roads of Europe passed the tales, stories, and experience of a developing proletariat. Meanwhile, the crime rates also escalated in such proportions that we can assume that a massive reclamation and reappropriation of the stolen communal wealth was underway. Today, the, these aspects of the transition to capitalism may seem, for Europe at least, things of the past. As Marx put it in the Grun Dries, historical preconditions of capitalist development to be overcome by more mature forms of capitalism. But the essential similarity between these phenomena and the social consequences of the new phase of globalization that we are witnessing tells us otherwise. Pauperization, rebellion, and the escalation of crime are structural elements of capitalist accumulation as capitalism must strip the workforce from its means of reproduction to impose its own rule. That in the industrializing regions of Europe by the 19th century, the most extreme forms of proletarian misery and rebellion had disappeared it is not a proof against this claim. Proletarian misery and rebellions did not come to an end. They only lessened to the degree that the super exploitation of workers had been exported through the institutionalization of slavery at first and later through the continuing expansion of colonial domination. As for the transition period, this remained in Europe a time of intense social conflict, providing the stage for a set of state initiatives that, judging from their effects, had three main objectives. A, to create a more disciplined workforce. B, to diffuse social protest. And C, to fix workers to the jobs forced upon them. 
Let us look at them in turn. In pursuit of social discipline, an attack was launched against all forms of collective sociality and sexuality, including sports, games, dances, ale wakes, festivals, and other group rituals that have been a source of bonding and solidarity among workers. It was sanctioned by a deluge of bills, 25 in England just for the regulation of alehouses in the years between 1601 and 1606. Peter Burke, in his work on that subject, has spoken of it as a campaign against popular culture. But we can see that what was at stake was the desocialization or decollectivization of the reproduction of the workforce, as well as the attempts to impose a more productive use of leisure time. This process in England reached its climax with the coming to power of the Puritans in the aftermath of the Civil War, 1642-49. What Civil War? When the fear of social indiscipline prompted the banning of all proletarian gatherings and merrymaking. What kind of shit? Who bans social gatherings? <laughs> like, what the hell? But, like, even, like, as I say there, whatever, like, you still see, it's like that today. Like, you can't stand outside on the corner or you'll get, like, arrested for loitering. And, like, if anyone calls the cops, you have to, like, stop having a party and stuff like that. Like, it's very closely regulated, like, whether people are allowed to hang out or not, which is, like, a police state and we're all in prison. But the moral reformation was equally intense in non-Protestant areas, where in the same period, religious processions were replacing the dancing and singing that had been held in and out of the churches. That sounds corny as hell. <laughs> Even the individual relation with God was privatized. Damn. In Protestant areas, with the institution of a direct relationship between the individual and the divinity, damn. In the Catholic areas, with the introduction of individual confession, that's crazy. The church itself as a community center, so like, whatever, I'm not gonna, let me just read this book, but like, like, you know how America loves individualism and, and like independence and like, people looking out for themselves and everything, that's like capitalist because it's about, you know what I'm saying? Like if it was, if it wasn't capitalist, it'd be like people take care of each other. Like, it's not like I have a personal relationship with God. Like my community has a relationship with God together, but like, whatever. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> The church itself as a community center ceased to host any social activity other than those addressed to the cults. As a result, the physical enclosure operated by land privatization and the hedging of the commons was amplified by a process of social enclosure. So, okay, so you see what it's like it wasn't just like physically enclosing physical public spaces, but also socially these spaces became private and like closed off. Like the social spaces. The reproduction of workers shifted from the open field to the home, from the community to the family. I've been saying fuck a family dog. <laughs> <laughs> from the public space, the common, the church, to the private. Secondly, in the decades between 1530 and 1560, a system of public assistance was introduced in at least 60 European towns, both by initiative of the local mun municipalities and by direct intervention of the central state. Its precise goals are still debated. 
While much of the literature on the topic sees the introduction of public assistance as a response to a humanitarian crisis that jeopardized social control, in his massive study of coerced labor, the French Marxist scholar Jan Mulier Boutin, um, let me Google that because that sounds cool. Study of forced labor? Yes, please. Okay, anyway. Insists that its primary objective was the great fixation of the proletariat, that is, the attempt to prevent the flight of labor. In any event, the introduction of public assistance was a turning point in the state relation between workers and capital and the definition of the function of the state. It was the first recognition of the unsustainability of a capitalist system ruling exclusively by means of hunger and terror. It was also the first step in the reconstruction of the state as the guarantor of the class relation and as the chief supervisor of the reproduction and disciplining of the workforce. Antecedents for this function can be found in the 14th century. When faced with the generalization of the anti-feudal struggle, the state had emerged as the only agency capable of confronting the working class. that was regionally unified, armed, and no longer confined in its demands to the political economy of the manor. I hate my accent. You just hear me say no longer. No longer. Be on a short. It's no longer available be on a short. <laughs> in 1351, with the passing of the Statute of Laborers in England, which fixed the minimum wage. Wait. Mm. the state had formally taken charge of the regulation and repression of labor, which the local lords were no longer capable of guaranteeing. But it was with the introduction of public assistance that the state began to claim ownership of the workforce. That's how they always get you, man. Anyway, let me not commentate. And a capitalist division of labor was instituted within the, working, the ruling class, enabling employers to relinquish any responsibility for the reproduction of workers in the certainty that the state would intervene either with the carrot or with the stick to address the inevitable crises. With this innovation, a leap occurred also in the management of social reproduction, resulting in the introduction of demographic recording, census taking. Man, they got you on the grid now, man. This shit is so crazy. The recording of mortality, natality, marriage rates. That's when surveillance started. And the application of accounting to social relations. Exemplary is the work of the administrators of the Bureau de Pauvre in Lyon, France, who by the end of the 16th century had learned to calculate the number of the poor assess the amount of food needed by each child or adult, and keep track of the deceased to make sure that nobody could claim assistance in the name of a dead person. Along with this new social science, an international debate also developed on the administration of public assistance, anticipating the contemporary debate on welfare. Should only those unable to work, described as the deserving poor, be supported? Or should able-bodied laborers unable to find a job also be given help? Man, if you're gonna... Okay. And how much or how little should they be given so as not to be discouraged from looking for work? These questions were crucial from the viewpoint of social discipline. What kind of shit? As a key objective of public aid was to tie workers to their jobs. But on these matters, a consensus could rarely be reached. <laughs> While humanist reformers like Juan Louis, wait, how did, that's not French, so Juan Luis Vives and spokesmen for the wealthy burghers 
recognize the economic and disciplinary benefits of a more liberal and centralized dispensation of charity. <clears throat> Not exceeding the distribution of bread, however, part of the clergy strenuously opposed the ban on individual donations. But across differences of systems and opinions, assistance was administered with such stinginess that it generated as much conflict as appeasement. Those assisted resented the humiliating rituals imposed on them, like wearing the mark of infamy, previously reserved for lepers and Jews, or in France, participating in the annual processions of the poor, in which they had to parade singing hymns and holding candles, and they vehemently protested when the alms were not promptly given or were inadequate to their needs. In response, in some French towns, gibbets were erected at the time of food distributions or when the poor were asked to work in exchange for the food they received. In England, as the 16th century pro progressed, receipt of public aid, also for children and the elderly, was made conditional on the incarceration of the recipients in workhouses where they became the experimental subjects for a variety of work schemes. Consequently, the attack on workers that had begun with the enclosures and the price revolution in the space of a century led to the criminalization of the working class, that is, the formation of a vast proletariat either incarcerated in the newly constructed workhouses and correction houses, or seeking its survival outside the law and living in open antagonism to the state, always one step away from the whip and the noose. Okay. From the viewpoint of the formation of a laborious workforce, this was a decisive failure. And the constant preoccupation with the question of social discipline in 16th and 17th century political circles indicates that the contemporary statesmen and entrepreneurs were keenly aware of it. I mean, this should have been culminating like for so long. Like they always been they always knew it wasn't like everyone capitalism obviously is unsustainable. Like it's very, very, very clear and apparent that it doesn't work. But it's just like a matter of how long they can still hoard everything before they get got. Moreover, the social crisis that this general state of rebelliousness provoked was aggravated in the second half of the 16th century by a new economic contraction, in great part caused by the dramatic population decline that occurred in Spanish America after the conquest and the shrinking of the colonial economies. Okay, so... We're not going to read that section now. I'm going to quit, but I'll be back so soon. Thank you for watching this video and reading along with me. I hope you're enjoying it as much as I am. And please like, comment, and subscribe for more. I take requests of communist, feminist, labor type books and enjoy the rest of your day. Love you. Bye.